Creating a persona on the internet is as easy as downloading pictures and making up a username. On tonight's edition of Scary Stories, we'll be covering such cases and encounters that people have had when coming face to face with being catfished. With that out of the way, let's jump right into it. Number 1. Stalker Finds My Home I don't even know how I want to begin to write this. I guess even after all this time, I'm still in shock. Shock to think there are people who exist who find some sort of satisfaction preying on people like me. First and foremost, allow me to begin my submission by giving you a little bit of background context. This first started happening around 2013. I'm female, and I was 22 years old. I've been using Instagram for about upwards of a year at that point to post pictures of my cosplaying. For me, cosplaying was a pastime I'd first developed in high school after I'd attended my first convention. My trademark was dressing up as female video game characters. My personal favorite was Lara Croft from the Tomb Raider series. Over time, I started to gather a fan base of sorts, only about 500 followers. Mostly everybody who followed me were very supportive. Comments about the outfits, as well as the research that went into playing each character. Of course, there were a few creepy comments here and there, but nothing to warrant any sort of serious actions. One day would be the start of something completely and utterly bizarre. I don't remember what exactly I was doing, but I ended up receiving a message from an account I was unfamiliar with. Thinking perhaps it was a new follower saying hello, I opened the message. It simply said something more or less of, Hello, hope you're having a great day. Love your pictures. Flattered, I responded back thanking them, and a conversation sparked. Before I knew it, I'd gone and followed him. I say him because when I clicked on his profile, it was some dude who also happened to cosplay. Nothing really seemed out of the ordinary. He had around 50 followers, and a bunch of selfies of him in various costumes. I would say he appeared to be around 25 years of age. Now, since this was some time ago, I don't remember his exact username, so we're just going to call him Zack. A couple of months passed since I first followed Zack, and we became pretty fast friends. I recall spending nights just talking about anime and video games, and we even set up a sort of date. It's where we would talk via Skype and watch anime. Well, that date did arrive, but something Zack mentioned began to raise alarms. I think it'd be easier if we video chat instead. Don't you agree? I had mentioned to Zack. He then proceeded to give me a bunch of excuses. First one was, I would, but I'm using my parents' old laptop. It doesn't have a camera. I then asked him if he had a cell phone. He makes another excuse saying it wasn't a smartphone, but instead a flip phone from the late 2000s. Hmm, must have been a pretty good one since all his selfies were a pretty decent camera quality. I desperately wanted to believe him. I'll admit, though I hadn't been able to see him via video chat, the pictures were all I needed. He was always very sweet, sending funny and cute animal pictures, and always wishing me a good morning and a good night. By the way, I forgot to mention this part, but right before I'd met Zack, I was going through a pretty bad breakup. My then partner was very toxic toward me, and it all came to a head when he tried coming after me with a knife after he had been out drinking with his friends. So my self-esteem was at an all-time low. More time passes on, and he pops the question of will you be my girlfriend. I was shocked, because though I'd more or less fallen for him, I never really considered ever dating someone over the internet. I found a sort of excitement, being able to claim I met someone online and be able to say we were now official. Of course, it was at this point some of my friends were telling me to be cautious of Zack. He was still very distant when it came to us talking via video chat, which raised concerns with my friends. One day, everything ended up changing. One of my friends, who we're going to call Maria, ended up texting me a bunch of pictures of a profile that she said she found on Instagram. I at first thought it was Zach's profile, but then I looked at the username. Completely different. 
That wasn't the only difference. This guy had around 5,000 followers, and his name was Evan. I was devastated, but still I tried to come up with some sort of reasoning, even though my brain was now telling me, the gig is up, honey. I looked further and further into this Evan's profile, and I was able to match every upload to those of Zach's, down to every last detail. However, Zach had failed to upload pictures of what looked to be like Evan's girlfriend. There were various photos of him posing with the same girl, even a couple of them where they were kissing. Again, I was pretty sad, but that soon started to turn into feelings of anger. How was it that I was so stupid, stupid, that someone had actually gone out of their way to use a false persona just to lure me in? To think... I had opened up to Zach. We'd become so close in our almost year relationship. I'd even told him very personal details, including where I was working, as well as my school. What really got to me, though, was when I clicked on some of the videos. Videos that were absent from Zach's profile. This is when I got the chills. The voice I was talking to sounded nothing like Evan's. You see, Zach's voice was more on the deeper end. He claimed it was because he was in an accident, which caused his voice to change. An obvious lie I would soon find out. Disappointed, I messaged Zach that night, and he spilled the beans. He told me he was too afraid to show his face because of how he looked. Honestly, I could have cared less about that. Sure, the photos of him were supposed to be nice, but when it came to personality, that's what really caught my attention. He proceeded to call me, and he spent over 20 minutes crying and apologizing. I honestly wasn't having any of it. Then, things turned downright creepy. He hung up the call, and then he sent a picture an hour later. It was a photo of a revolver, with a couple of bullets next to it. The following text said, I can't live without you. Please, I don't want to do this. Give me another chance. I got so freaked out, mainly because the last thing I wanted was for him to cause harm to either himself or others. Pretty much he was guilt tripping me. I'll be honest, I had no clue what to do. I told him I wouldn't mind talking, but this whole creepy thing had to come to an end. Things then settled as I talked to Zach less and less, and before I knew it, his profile literally disappeared. One day I tried calling his cell phone out of curiosity, but it had told me the number was no longer in service. Then one day, something happened that I alluded to at the beginning about this being so bizarre. This occurring in late 2014. I was home alone babysitting my youngest sister and we were in the backyard playing. All of a sudden, I heard my name being called from the side door, the one that lets you into the backyard. I didn't recognize the man. He appeared to be in his late 40s. He was also bald, had acne, glasses, and was somewhat overweight. Hi there, how, how can I help you? I questioned him as I told my little sister to head inside the house. It's me, Zach. Don't you remember who I am? I wanted to come over in person, just so I can see you. Instantly, the memories and pain of the past came back to me, like hitting a wall of bricks. Uh, hi, Zach. Actually, this is a bad time. Can, can we talk some other day? No, I don't think so. I drove over 13 hours just so I can come see you. I was hoping I might find you. How I wish my dad was home. He would have beat this guy up like an MMA fighter. Come on, Emily. Let's go inside and play with your toys. I express to my sister as I grab her hand and we start making our way to the back door. I couldn't believe what happened next, but it did. He manages to unlock that side door, and he comes walking over to my sister and I, who at this point had already made it inside our home. Let me in. I just want to talk to you, that's all. He was a freak. He had a knife in his hand, and an expression that said, I'm going to kill you. Emily starts crying, and I tell her to head into her room and lock herself in there. All the while, a light bulb goes off in my head. Are all the windows and doors locked? I think he caught the expression on my face because as soon as I leave his sight, I can hear him run to the front of the house. Thankfully, the front door was locked as well as the other windows. Here was when something happened. 
I was now on the phone with police describing the potential intruder when I started to hear an argument. It was my neighbor, John. John is ex-Marines, and he noticed Zach had a knife in his hand. No joke. I watched as Zach started running toward John, but John, bless his heart, took this guy down. Not only was he able to disarm him, but he put him into a chokehold. All the while, he called to a buddy of his who happened to be inside his house. Finally, officers arrived, and they, in short summary, took this guy into custody. Ugh, that was a lot for me to go over. Sorry the story was so long. Anyways, it was later relayed to me that he had a bunch of rope, duct tape, and some syringes in the back of his van. Something tells me those weren't going to be gifted to me. Now, I don't really have much in form of proof to provide, but I can show you the screenshots I took of some of our conversations over text message and even Skype. Since I did end up getting a new phone not too long after he was arrested, I hadn't backed everything up. Also, since he got rid of his Instagram, I never did screenshot that stuff. I should have, but I never expected it would straight up disappear. So that's it. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to clear up any loose ends in the comments section. I've already told the creepy fox. I told him to let me know when he includes this story. That way I can be more active in the comments and see what you have to say. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe. Make smart decisions, friends. And be careful with those that you talk to over the internet. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying today's episode. Before we continue, I want to take this opportunity to thank my channel members, Robbie, Bew, and Kim. If you'd like to help support what I do here, then check out the channel memberships option. It's right next to where it says subscribe. Thank you. Now, let's continue. Number 2. I received a mystery box from a catfish. Ah, uh, my senior year of high school. How whack it was, if I'm being quite honest. I mean, sure, I was getting ready to graduate and head to college, but I'd also met somebody over the internet who I'd become pretty close to. Taking place around 2009, this story is sort of old, but it does go to show you that even before social media became popular, there were still people like the person I'm going to describe. Anyways, I'd first met, air quotations by the way, Rachel, on YouTube after I'd started posting some AMVs. Her comments were the ones that stood out the most because she was one of the very few that actually asked about me. Most people were just in it to see the clips from their favorite shows time to the popular music I used. Now, while most people used random pictures for their profile, I was actually one of the rare ones who used a picture of myself. Scratch that. Actually, Rachel was using a picture herself too. At least from what she told me. Rachel was actually pretty cute. Blonde hair, blue-eyed girl, and she honestly looked like a model. Pretty much what I would expect a Rachel to look like. Anyways, if you were around YouTube in that time, there was a feature that was sort of like Super Chat. In it, you could talk to one another, but you could also create a playlist of videos that you could more or less watch together. At any time, you were actually free to add videos to said playlist, and it was something I'd done with some of my subscribers. So, yeah, Rachel and I started to talk more and more in these subscriber hangouts, and one day, she asked if we could talk on AIM. I was starting to enjoy our conversations, so we moved it over there. Over time, some alarm bells started to ring in my head. You see, I had no problem showing her pictures of what I looked like, since I had nothing to hide. She always complimented me on how cute I was, and how she would do anything to be with me. It really made my heart skip a beat. When she would send me pictures, they looked different. Don't get me wrong, Rachel was beautiful, but there is some discrepancies. Each picture looked like it was from a different person, but they did share that same cute eyeliner that was in the original profile picture of Rachel. I went ahead and just accepted this as a truth, thinking perhaps it was the lighting in which the pictures were taken. At some point in our online relationship, 
if you want to call it that. I asked if we could talk over the phone, but she always had a convenient excuse. I'm busy. My phone doesn't work. Or my personal favorite. I actually don't have a cell phone. Right. Pretty funny to think somebody who claimed to be 19 years old and was apparently a popular girl had no sort of cell phone. Finally, however, I was able to convince her to call me. We set the date and time, and I'll be honest, I was scared the whole day. I think it was more because I was nervous, but I couldn't focus in class. Later that night, she texted me telling me she was ready. My hands were shaking uncontrollably. I remember my heart beating like a drum as my sweaty thumbs typed in the phone number that she had given me. Hello? Julian? Is that really you? Her voice. It was nothing like I expected. Now, I'm not trying to be mean, but it sounded like I was talking to somebody in their 50s. Still, I was so struck by Rachel that I accepted her voice as I had heard it. Gosh, looking back on this, I was so stupid not to listen to my friends. The next day at school, they kept going on about how Rachel wasn't who she claimed to be because somebody must have been messing with me. I wanted to prove them wrong. I wanted to meet Rachel in person, and I wanted to show her to my friends. There was only one problem. Rachel lived far. Well, not too far. I was living in Oregon, and she was living in Southern California. Fast forward to 2011, and I now had a Facebook as for Rachel, I was starting to slowly move on from her. It got to the point where I was tired of the excuses she was constantly giving me. And it actually got so bad, we actually had a fight. I think she eventually got the hint, and her constant messaging came to an end. Now, this would be the part where I wish I could say, that's the end of my story. But unfortunately, it's not. Eventually, I ended up getting an actual girlfriend... So, of course, came the love posts. I remember the first one I put up, which was of both of us holding hands looking at the sunset. The caption read more or less, The love of my life. All of my friends reacted with congratulations and about time. However, out of the blue, I ended up getting a message from Rachel. At this point, it had been well over a year since I last talked to her. So, this is what you've been up to. You've been chasing somebody else and cheating on me this whole time? How dare you? I don't like people who lie to me. Let's get one thing straight. I may have liked, and I use that lightly and in air quotations, Rachel, but I never claimed that I loved her or that I wanted us to be anything but friends. Rachel then proceeded to send both me and my girlfriend very threatening messages. It got so bad we had to block her, and things once again went silent. Bear in mind, I had a new phone number, so she wasn't able to contact me. Oh yeah, what important detail. During our talks, I had mentioned the school I was attending, and even more or less where I lived. Rachel, I couldn't believe it, actually was able to get my address, and she sent me a new message under a new profile. She told me that if I didn't accept her back, she was going to come to my house and kill everything that lives there that being myself and my family. That was followed by a video taken of her computer screen. It showed my address on a map, and next to the computer was a butcher's knife. At the end of the video, she actually revealed what she truly looked like, albeit she was only on camera for about four seconds. Wow, let me tell you, no 19-year-old Rachel here. I was correct in assuming she was 50-ish years old. Anyways, I was so frightened by the messages that I told her I was going to call the police. She dared me to do so, but I think even she was having second thoughts. I told her she needed to get some serious help, and this surprisingly seemed to have clicked something in a disturbed mind. Just like that, things went cold, until one day a year later. I was returning home from work, and I noticed a package on my front doorstep. Guess who it was from? Rachel. It had her name right there. I was too scared to open it, so I actually went to the police department and we opened it there. It was pretty innocent for the most part. It had some chocolates and candies and a teddy bear. But that's not all that we found. There was a letter inside it 
It read, I'm so sorry for everything I did. Can you forgive me, my love? I promise, this will be the last time you ever hear from me. I have this teddy bear for you, just to show you how much I love you. Please, give him a good squeeze. He's very soft and loving. Something about the teddy bear was giving the officer and I the creeps. We were right in assuming something was up, because when we checked behind it, it was obviously tampered with. Stuffed inside was a dirty and used syringe needle. It was pretty much pointed where if I had ended up squeezing it, it would have poked me. Just imagine if I touched it. Well, officers told me they would launch an investigation, but sadly, they never did find her location or who she truly was. Just like that, Rachel had disappeared. Not even the video I saved was enough to identify who she was due to the poor camera quality. Also, I'm 100% sure she personally delivered the box. Reason being was one of my neighbors told me they saw a suspicious person with a hoodie covering their face looking into my windows. My neighbor then claimed she saw this mystery person drop off a box before driving away. Obviously, there would be no way the postal service would have sent this without suspicions being arisen. So, that was the time of when I was catfished then given a package with what could have potentially put me in the hospital, or worse. Number 3. False Paintings of Hope I first met Alexa on Instagram back in 2014. No, I'm not talking about the one from Amazon. Alexa was an artist who posted various photographs of the paintings she created. I, being an art major, fell in love with her page, and I would look forward to her postings. Now, unlike most catfish stories where you're contacted by the stranger, I was actually the one who initiated the conversation. It was more so to express my love for our similar interests. I was surprised. She was very friendly. She told me I was one of the very few people who actually messaged her. And in honor of our new friendship, she told me she wanted to send me some gifts. I denied the request but eventually she was able to convince me to give her my P.O. box. A few days later, I got a package with prints of her drawings. They were of lions and tigers, my favorite animals. I also learned that she only lived three hours away from me. What a small world. Now, so far, things might seem fairly innocent, a blossoming friendship over the internet. And yes, you would be led to assume everything was fine. I became so invested with my new online friend, we actually exchanged phone numbers and we would text each other almost daily. Now, at some point in our talks, I started to become curious. I wanted to know what she looked like. However, I didn't want to be that awkward follower who asked for a photo. After all, was it really necessary? It's not like I was planning on meeting her. Well, as expected, she was reluctant to share any sort of photos, but she did send me one after she seemingly changed her mind. When I received a said photo, something seemed a little too familiar. I couldn't put my finger on it, but it's like I'd seen it somewhere before. Was it over on Tumblr? Or maybe Facebook? Whatever, I ended up ignoring the coincidence, and several more months passed. It's by this point we had been talking for well over a year. That friendship turned into a relationship. The days of, hello friend, turned into, hello my love as every day I awoke and went to sleep with a loving message. This is the part where it's important to mention I never actually talked to her via phone call. She had sent me some more photos of her, but again, there was no actual talking. I think it had to do with me being more nervous than anything. I'll admit, I was an absolute wreck back then. I was the nerdy kid who was always shy to talk to anyone. Heck, you couldn't even get me to do a presentation in front of my fellow classmates without me having a panic attack. I think that's why Alexa gave me some false confidence, and I was led to believe everything she told me, such as why she couldn't talk or even video call. Looking back, I'm sure she was taking advantage of my confidence issues. One day, however, there was a game changer. Alexa told me she wanted to meet in person so that we could actually go out on a date. Never having experience in this sort of thing, I automatically said yes, without even second-guessing it. 
A time and day is set, and she was to arrive at my place on a Saturday when my parents weren't home. Yes, my stupid self had given this stranger my address without even truly knowing her intentions. Anyways, the day arrives and she texts me saying she was a couple of hours from getting to my house. I started to become a nervous wreck. It got so bad I had to call my cousin Daniel. This was for the very first time I actually told someone about who I had met online. Daniel didn't exactly have the kindest of words to say to me. Let me get this straight. You've been in a relationship with someone over the internet and you haven't even talked via the phone? Don't you find that just a bit suspicious? Look, cousin, if you're really set to meet her, have her wait for you at a McDonald's or a coffee shop. He was right, but I had already given her my address, so it's not like I could hide from her. I told him I would follow his advice, but I didn't follow it. Soon my heart skips a beat when my phone lights up with a notification. It was Alexa. Hey babe, I think I found your house. Just give me a couple of minutes so I can get ready. Sure thing. I nervously responded as I went to grab some of the roses I was saving in the kitchen, ready to meet her with a warm embrace. A minute passes, and I went over to the living room window so I could see if I could spot her. There in the driveway was a dark blue Saburu outback with its windows completely tinted. Another few minutes passed, and there was still no sign of Alexa. Hey, that's you and the Subaru, right? Stop keeping me waiting, my love. Sorry, I'm just really nervous. I'm coming out now. The door opens, and finally I would be able to meet Alexa. Wait a minute. Who was this? I began to question as beginning to walk to my front door wasn't the girl from the pictures. Instead, it was an older woman, probably in her 40s. She honestly looked like a mom. I went to the door, and I went to go greet this woman. Hello there, miss. Are you lost or something? I replied, trying desperately to hold on to any sort of explanation. I'm... Alexa, I'm the one you've been talking to all this time. I was devastated and my heart was broken. All this time, I thought I was talking to this college girl around my age, but instead it was all a sham. I started to shake with anger as she began to apologize saying that the pictures of her were real, just from when she was younger. I found it incredibly hard to believe. If it was her, and she was the age I guessed, that would mean the pictures would have needed to be taken around the 1990s. I called her out on the obvious lie she made up in that moment, because I'm pretty sure she thought I was dumb enough to fall for it. But she soon ended up admitting she had used photos from some random girl's Facebook profile. Now, I didn't want to end this in a low point. I blame my forgiving nature. So I had her explain why she did this. She told me it was because she was lonely and she had nobody to talk to. Why couldn't she have just been honest? I say to myself, Look, I don't mind being your friend, but this whole relationship thing needs to end. Also, the pictures need to end. No more using photos you found on the internet. She agreed with me. And then she said, Okay, I learned my lesson. Could I possibly get a goodbye kiss on the cheek? Absolutely not. Well, I didn't actually tell her that, though I should have. I just said not right now. Then she left. Once I was back in my home, I started crying, and for the next few weeks I fell into deep sadness. My parents began to notice my behavior, but I was too ashamed to admit what happened. Eventually I told them and my cousin, and they were pretty upset. They quickly switched to sympathy though. Anyways, it was at this point I'd learned about reverse searching photos, so I took the one she sent me, and I did a search. I was able to locate the girl. I won't use her real name for privacy reasons, so I'll call her Samantha. Yep, every last photo was of this Samantha girl, but that wasn't the only shocker. She too was an artist, and from the photo she posted, I could tell the so-called artist from Instagram I met was a sham. She had clearly stolen the photos and claimed ownership. I messaged the woman, and I pretty much broke the news that her time was up. A few days later, her account was gone, and I never heard from her again. Now I understand it's not super scary under the normal definition, but just think about it for a second. Think about how somebody can just take your photos and identity, and they could pretend to be you. Wouldn't you say that's scary? To make things worse, they take advantage of your kindness, 
and in my case, they show up to your home. Update. A year later, I moved out to graduate school. One night, my parents had been returning from the movie theater, and they saw someone walking around our home. It was a woman who claimed she wanted to see me. Telling her I no longer lived there, the woman ended up leaving shortly after. Later, when my parents told me the details, I asked them what she looked like, as well as what vehicle she drove. They explained her exactly like the woman who drove three hours just to come see me. That was the final time my parents, or myself, ever saw her. Number 4. Drew, the Tinder Guy Before I begin, just know that this takes place from the perspective of a female. Anyways, college was pretty tough. By definition, it was as expected. Being a biology major meant that my full attention was focused on reading and studying. This took a toll on my love life. By the time I graduated, I was 25 years old and had only been in a relationship once when I was 16. That lasted for a little under two years. Happy to have a degree, but sad to be alone. I wasn't sure how to feel with this next part of my career. I mean, I ended up getting a job working with one of my professors, but each day seemed so empty. Part of me wanted to start settling down, but I had been out of the game, so to speak, for such a long while. This was for the very first time I actually tried out Tinder, a dating app some of my friends had been using in the past. Most of the time when I heard of Tinder, it was usually just a lemmy smash story, and then you move on. However, I had seen it worked wonders for one of my closest friends, Mary. She and her now fiancé had been getting along so well that I really wanted to try something like that, so I made a profile and I started getting matched with various guys. I was looking for a guy that was like me, someone looking for a serious relationship. You can also add all the other little details I enjoy, such as running, playing guitar, and drawing. Eventually, I was matched with a few people within my 25 mile radius. One guy in particular was named Drew. He caught my attention. He was a graduate of the University of California, and he studied marine biology. He was pretty cute. For the next three months, we talked daily over the phone. I'll admit, I was head over heels, but I did find it weird he was always busy. Anytime we would try to set up a date, he would always have the perfect excuse. This should have been my wake-up call to stop wasting my precious time, but my mind didn't listen. I was so in love. I couldn't believe he was even talking to me to begin with. Here I was, this shy, awkward science girl, and here he was, what looked to be like a model. After some pushing and convincing, my friend Mary was able to convince me to get him to agree to meet up with me at a Starbucks. The sad part was, the day arrived, and he never did show up. There I was, looking out the window, with my coffee getting cold with every passing minute. I remember being more confused than angry. Was it possible he went to the wrong Starbucks? That couldn't be, since it was the only one in the general area. Besides, he never did mention he was lost. The next day, he messaged me, and he said he had showed up to the Starbucks, but he was too afraid to walk over to me because of how beautiful I was. Not even. Anyways, I didn't believe him. That's until he described my outfit, as well as the stickers on my laptop. I asked him if he truly loved me, and he said yes, to which I replied, then just meet me. He didn't respond back to that for about a week. This was the point when I think the guilt was starting to outweigh his senses. He told me the person in the Tinder profile picture was someone he went to school with. After that revelation, he sent me a picture of what he actually looked like. He was pretty decent looking, don't get me wrong, but I didn't appreciate being lied to. I told him that he would have to waste somebody else's time, and that was it. Fast forward a year, love had come to me naturally, and I met someone while I was working. At last, it seemed life was going in the right direction, and the catfish encounter was nothing but a silly memory of the past. Sadly, this wouldn't be my final encounter with Drew. My partner, we will call him David, and myself were actually on a date, and we were sitting in the park feeding some ducks. Who would have guessed that Drew happened to be there? Anyways, I almost didn't recognize him. That's until he walked over to us. Oh, hey there, Brandy. I see you're dating somebody else. 
What, was I not good enough for you? David actually knew who he was, since I'd mentioned him before. Look, man, you need to leave now. We're kind of busy. No kidding. Drew took out a pocket knife, and then he went after David. David, however, was able to counter his incoming attack since he took self-defense classes. He pretty much made an embarrassment of Drew, and he told him never to bother me or him again. We then left the park, and that was the last time we'd ever seen him. Before we get to the final story, I just wanted to go ahead and give you all a quick reminder. If you're ever looking for extra content, whether it be art, previews, or sneak peeks, then make sure to be following me over on my Instagram, at the Creepy Fox Official. Thanks, I'll see you there. But for now, let's get on to our last entry. Number 5. Rock Fans Unite? Never Again About 6 years ago when I was 19, I was introduced to Reddit, a place where similar-minded people can share their thoughts and opinions on certain topics and themes. You could share pictures, memes, ideas, whatever it was. I really found my place in the music community, and I really clicked with my fellow rockers. Being an 80s rock fan, I was and still am into groups such as ACDC and Guns N' Roses. You name it. I'll save you all the details, but eventually I started talking with this other person, who for convenience we're going to name Randy. Randy, at least according to our initial conversations, was in a rock band with his high school friends, which I found to be pretty neat. I eventually added him on Facebook, and we started to talk. However, shortly after I added him on Facebook, he started to get very pushy. It first began with him telling me that his previous girlfriend had left him, and he had fallen into sadness. He hoped that our developing friendship over the internet wouldn't lead to heartbreak, as he claimed I saved him. This was the part where I should have just blocked him and moved on, because he told me that if I ever broke his heart, he was going to end it all. I knew where he was coming from. I too had been in a pretty bad relationship myself, and I was pretty close to going over the edge, mentally speaking, but I had the support system in my family and my closest friends. I promised Randy I would never say or do anything that would hurt him. Eventually, however, I ended up getting into another relationship, and this only seemed to fuel Randy's insecurities. Note that I never made it clear I wanted for us to be boyfriend and girlfriend, not only because of the distance, but because I didn't want to date someone from the internet. It sounds sort of mean looking back, but I hadn't heard so many creepy stories. Anyways, Randy started to send me a bunch of pretty messed up messages, saying I was a liar and that I needed to be with him, not this new boyfriend. I tried my best to reassure him this didn't stop us from being friends, but he wouldn't let it go. You and I, we were supposed to get married. Why did you have to break my heart? Again, never was there a mention of a relationship. He somehow mistook my kindness, thinking we had been dating. I spent the next couple of hours thinking of what I could tell Randy, eventually opting to ignore him. Big mistake. A few weeks ended up passing, and my partner and I were over at my house watching some movies. Out of the blue, my golden retriever began to bark. I thought it was Amazon delivering some of my school books. Thus, I got up from the couch, and I head toward my door. Before opening it, however, I looked through the peephole. On the other end was a man in a red hoodie. Can I help you with something? I said, with the most intimidating voice I could muster up. Is this Kimberly's house? Kimberly is my name, by the way. Yes, this is her. Can I help you? The dude starts pounding on my front door, demanding I let him in. It's Randy. Please, can I talk to you? What in the world? This was Randy? It sure didn't look like the person I'd grown to know. Randy from Facebook had short brown hair and green eyes, with a nose ring around 20 years old. The person standing outside was a man looking to be in his early 50s. Nothing too special. Sort of chubby and short. I'd estimate it around 5 foot 8. My dog is barking like crazy, and this gets my partner's attention. Look, dude. You need to leave. Police are already on the way. I'm saying this because we're going to give you a chance. Never come back, or I'll personally make sure of it. Randy didn't budge for a couple of minutes, until officers eventually arrived. They questioned him, and to this day, I don't understand how officers just let him go, 
but they did. However, I did get a restraining order, and that seemed to have worked wonders. By the way, I never told him about where I lived. That's where I'm led to believe. He must have looked me up somehow, and managed to find my address. Such a scary thought. This man used false pictures. I just hope he isn't trying to catfish others, but I'm not too sure. I blocked him on all my social ages ago, and I haven't bothered looking him up since. Hey friends, thank you for making it to the end of today's video. If you enjoyed it, and this is the first time you've seen one of my videos, then make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell. I upload brand new scary stories videos here every single week, and I know you won't want to miss any of it. From Home Alone stories, stalkers, the woods, you name it. Topics of different varieties are always featured here. Just earlier this week I released a video on Valentine's Day stories, which if you missed it, make sure to go back and give it a listen. Last but least, make sure to check out the brand new merchandise and channel memberships for more of the Creepy Fox. Anyways friends, that's going to be it for today. I'll talk to you all next time. Take care and have yourself an amazing day.